Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and Horror. Today we will explore the domain of Demolu, a coastal domain that is home to an advanced and influential society, the cultural heart of the core, and a cauldron of intrigue and social problems, ready to explode. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this video will focus on the module of the classic Ravenloft setting, and will consider the events and characters that existed in the domain prior to the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft reboot. At the end of my video coverage of the module from the classic Ravenloft setting, I will make some considerations and comparisons with the new version of the module in the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft. Some maps I will be using in this video were created by Richard de Reville, who has been leading a project to create beautiful maps for Ravenloft domains and cities. You can check out the amazing work he's been doing in the Ravenloft Cartograph Society community on Facebook. I will leave the link to the page in the video description. Are you ready? After a journey along crooked roads, we finally left the lands of Mordent behind and enter the domain of Demolu, in what is perhaps one of the most advanced and influential societies in the Land of the Mists. As we travel its roads and cities, we head towards its capital to meet the famous detective Alanik Ray, and with his support, find the whereabouts of the missing monster hunter Dr. Rudolf von Richten, to fulfill our promise and cleanse us of our sins before receiving the cure of lycanthropy. Dimolu is a Ravenloft domain shrouded in intrigues, secrets and manipulation, and home to one of the most sophisticated and influential societies in the Land of the Mists. While the horrors that inhabited Dimolu may be more subtle and insidious, this domain is the perfect stage for plots of intrigue, manipulation and betrayals. The domain is set in the Renaissance era, and is one of the most culturally advanced domains in the core of the Lands of the Mists. The cultural reference of this domain is inspired by Renaissance France, and the social disparity and revolutions that took place in its history. The Dimolu domain is located in the western region of the Ravenloft core, the continent where most of the domains that compose the setting are clustered. Dimolu borders the lands of Morden to the south, the realm of Rishmulu and Falkovnia to the east, the Sea of Sorrows to the west, and the domain of Lamordia to the north. The events of the Grand Conjunction did not alter its border or its neighboring kingdoms. Dimolu's climate is temperate and is considerably pleasant, rarely reaching extreme temperatures. During the winter, some places are covered by a small layer of snow, and in the summer, there are a few days when the temperature can be considered unpleasantly hot. Rains are frequent during spring and autumn. The geography of this region can also be considered gentle and smooth, without major terrain accidents or elevations. The domain is taken over by rolling plains and gentle hills, and presents a beautiful scenery for those who cross it. The coast of Dimolu is also considered to be more peaceful and serene than the rocky walls and cliffs of Mordent and Lamordia, its neighbors to the south and north, and has beaches and soft dunes along its length. Numerous bays and coves can also be identified along the coast, with deep waters that allow navigation. The most important of these formations is Pernod Bay, where the great city of Port Alicine is located, and near it is the Sable Bay, which is surrounded by large states and mansions of the aristocracy. The River Muzard is the main river that crosses the region, entering the western border, coming from Falkovnia, and heading north, where it meets the Vuka River and goes to Lamordia. 
The Rio Mozart serves as a geographic landmark and natural border between Dimoli and the Bellicose realm of Falkovnia. Due to this tumultuous relationship, there is only a single bridge for crossing the river, and many use ferries to make the crossing when they are far from it. During the rainy season, this region is prone to flooding, and commercial vessels crossing the river must be careful not to get their vessels bogged down in these treacherous waters. Along the eastern border, near the coast of the river Muzad, there are a vast number of marginal lakes, formed and fed by these floods. This region offers beautiful landscapes, and the lakes are known for the colorful tints they display when reflecting light during sunrise and sunset. The most famous of this lake is Bois de Bijou, or the Jill Box, and some believe these lakes have rejuvenating properties. Many members of the aristocracy visit the lakeside region in summer to bathe in its waters. Dimoli is crossed by two main roads. The Mule Road comes from Mordant in the south and leads to the town of Chateaufort. The road that connects Chateaufort to Port Alucine is known as Avenue de Progress or Progress Avenue. Both roads are well kept in the domain of Dimoli and their limits are marked by birch and plane trees, providing shade for the large flow of travelers and traders. The eastern side of Dimoli, close to the Falkovnian border, is quite fertile, and there we can find most of the farms that supply their cities. As you move away from the river Muzad, the soil becomes increasingly sandy, and soil productivity is reduced. Therefore, this region has a much smaller number of agricultural properties, and except for a few oceans, we can find some sparse woods and forests, usually formed by birch, plain and oak trees. As we approach the coast, the sandy soil no longer supports large vegetation, and only grass, shrubs and low vegetation adorn the landscape, such as heather, lantana and wax myrtle. A flower native to this coastal region deserves to be highlighted. Lipowort produces a pink flower with a yellow center that swells like a small pea during the seed season. If squeezed, this vegetation produces a sweet and syrupy liquid, similar to honey, whose ingestion can make users more suggestible. It is widely speculated that intoxication with this substance is used by the aristocracy on their constant intrigues and games of manipulation, and that such a plant is used to stimulate to debauched and scandalous behavior at social events. Although it is not an area known for its varied vegetation, the people of Dimolu are fond of gardening. Large properties have elaborated and sophisticated garden, and less grandiose houses also have the habit of adorning their window balconies with decorative plants. Bimoli has a fauna typical of a temperate climate, with rabbits, deer, wild boar and foxes among other typical animals. However, the few and sparse wild areas that remain make wildlife sparse. The domain has a wide variety of birds, with pigeons, castrels, buzzards and seagulls that infest the Hebel area. In cities, especially in the slums and sewers, rats and other pests abound. Compared to other domains that surround it, the region of Dimolu appears to be safer and free from other supernatural threats, and although rumors and superstition about ghosts and werebeasts may gain the mind of the populace. These threats seem to be less prominent in these lands. Dimolu attracts many visitors due to its great cultural influence. Its capital is considered a hub of arts and fashion, and a major educational and commercial center, and many foreigners can be found on its streets. The native population of Dimolu have a strong sense of pride, and like to distinguish themselves from their neighbors, but they seem to have some relation to the population of the lands of Mordant, their southernmost neighbor. These, perhaps, indicate that both regions 
were engulfed by the mists of the same original world at some point in the past. Demolieurs are usually tall, slender and athletic, and a wide range of colors can be found in their eyes. Their complexion ranges from pale to an olive tone, but it is difficult to identify their skin tone among the nobility, who have the habit of using frequent and excessive makeup that pale their faces. Their hair is usually blonde or light brown, with some individuals having auburn hair. Men wear their hair short, but often keep beards and moustaches neatly trimmed and groomed, sometimes meticulously styled with the use of wax to ensure its curvature and shape. Women wear their hair long, with aristocrats wearing it tied up in buns, adorned with bows and curls while the women from the simpler class usually wear braids. Hair is not the only way in which Demolu society differentiated its classes, and fashion is the main way in which the aristocracy can be easily distinguished from the plebs. The clothes of the poorest and most miserable population consist of simple cotton trousers and shirts for men, and unadorned dresses, skirts and bodices for women. The nobility, however, are expected to adhere to the latest poor Alucine fashion, under the penalty of being excluded from their social circle or seeing their prestige decline. Keeping up with the latest variation in Demolus fashion is an arduous and costly task, and hardly anyone without financial resources would be able to keep to the latest style for a long period. The women's dresses are elaborate and involve considerable preparation with layers of corsets, bodices, petticoats, stockings, heels, and colorful silk dresses full of bows and brocades. The latest men's fashion involves the use of silk shirts and breeches, tight white leggings that go up to the knees, accompanied by knee-length coats with large folded back cuffs, in bright colors and with brocades. The shoes and boots are dark, with high heels and buckles, and the use of a three-pointed federal hat is common. At social events, members of the aristocracy wear makeup to pale their faces, and often pluck cheeks and make false spots to mark their faces. At official events, men and women are expected to wear expensive and elaborate wigs, with white, curly and covered hair. In Dimolu, the language spoken is Modernish, and it points once again to the common origin between Modern and Dimolu. This language was born from the fusion of two other languages, and is divided into two dialects. High Modernish is considered a sonorous and elegant language, and is preferred by the aristocracy and artists. In the domain of Dimolu, the high modernish is the most commonly used, and low modernish, more practical and less sonorous, is used only within the poorest's home or for commercial negotiations with foreigners. The people of Dimolu have a strong sense of identity, and given the cultural influence of their domain, it is not uncommon for them to see themselves as more intelligent and advanced than their neighbors. However, as with all aspects of Dimolieu's society, there is a great chasm in access to education between the plebs and the aristocracy. Since the revolt of 707 of the Barovian Canada, which led to the death by guillotine of the former Lord Governor, the government has guaranteed basic education for children of all social classes. The nobility rarely use such public services preferring private schools and tutors for their children. Access to education for the poorer classes ends with the first years of their childhood, and they quickly need to dedicate themselves to work, to learn a trade and survive. Education for young and adolescents continues through boarding school, educational centers that house aristocratic and wealthy children to complete their education. These schools have gained great prestige for their excellence in education, and they receive students from different parts of the core, 
consolidating the influence of the Demurieux culture. Finally, the truly wealthy can attend the prestigious University of Dimolu, one of the most renowned in the whole land of the mists. The Demolieurs' way of life is established by their social class and there is a charge between the nobility and the commoners. Almost all property and business are under the possession and control of the aristocracy, who accumulate all wealth and resources. These nobles are rarely involved in the management of these affairs, however, leaving such tasks to their subordinates. As consequence, they have the time to devote themselves to a hedonistic lifestyle of luxury and excess, worrying only about their own status, their apparent sophistication and prestige, rumors and intrigue. The life of the lower classes is exhausting, and they engage in the most different labor activities, in commercial and industrial enterprises of the aristocracy, or provide services as guards, housekeepers and cooks in the mansions of the wealthy. Since the rebellion of 707, the nobility ensured a minimum of food and shelter for those under their services, but although they liked to declare their benevolence in establishing a social advancement, the truth is that such lodgings and food is largely precarious and degrading. These minimal concessions to prevent a new rebellion or revolution are insufficient, and little by little, dissatisfaction and revolt among the pleb grows, and perhaps another bloody revolt might ignite in Demolu. Perhaps the only point of contact between Demolu's plebs and nobility is their passion for art. The culture of Demolu influences several realms with which it maintains contact and the great charts that divide the classes in this domain is inhabited by the artist class, who can rise or fall from grace according to their popularity. Art is highly valued in Dimoli, and a defining trait of its culture and sophistication. The education of the young includes incentives for the artistic creation, and it's common that after completing their basic studies, Young aristocrats spend at least a year of their lives dedicating themselves to their artistic sensibilities. Aristocrats are expected to understand and appreciate art, and the vie for prestige demonstrating their commitment and artistic sophistication by becoming patrons of renowned artists. A popular artist can quick rise to a high standard of living and become welcome in the aristocratic courts. If he becomes popular with poor Alucine most renowned critics and influencers, this rapid rise does not ensure their permanence in this privileged position, and artists who fail to maintain the elite's interest can quickly fall from grace and slip back into poverty. The cultural influence of Dimoli, the possibility of social ascension, and the great investment in the arts attract artists from all over the land of the mist to its cities, and success in art is sometimes the only hope of social ascension of the lower classes. All forms of the arts are appreciated, and exhibitions of paintings and sculptures are common in Port Alucine, at events frequented by the nobility. Fashion is also considered a form of art in Dimoli and it's not uncommon for exhibitions to be carried out by the most influential courtier, setting the trend for the coming season. Music and theatre are also highly appreciated, and talented musicians, actors and authors come to Port Alucine in hope of gaining fame and renown for their plays and musical compositions. A specific type of dance with complex movements, called ballet, has become popular in Port Alucine, and schools dedicated to this art select the best and most talented dancers. Finally, Port Alucine became an artistic reference for operas, theatrical dramas presented with powerful vocal performances, accompanied by musical pieces. The launch of a new play at the Grand Opera Nationale of Port Alucine is the culmination of the city's cultural sophistication, attracting all the aristocracy 
and even foreigners to accompany these performances. The people of Dimoli do not live only of high culture. For every successful artist, dozens roam the city in search of fame, and the streets, taverns and amphitheaters are full of musicians and actors who perform to make a living. Recently, literature works with macabre tales of horror, and theater and exhibitions of the grotesque and burlesque have gained popularity. The cuisine is also marked by refinement and sophistication, and restaurants and cafes, with tables spread out along the sidewalks, are highly sought after by local and tourists. Dimoli dishes are usually light and have lamb, venison and wild boar, accompanied by mushrooms, onions and pepper. Different types of cheese and wine are famous products of the region, and more sophisticated dishes can include oysters, mussels, foie gras, quail eggs and even scargo as its main ingredients. Dimoulieu's architecture is also a clear distinction between the social classes. Its cities and urban centers are taken by narrow buildings, which are squeezed along the streets, and which are three to four stories high. These buildings are sometimes decorated with stone frescoes, and have large windows facing the streets, from which decorative flowers vases sometimes embellish the facades. The dark bricks used in construction are most often painted in pastel or turquoise tones. The aristocracy, wealthy bourgeois or famous artists live in these buildings, with the richest living in larger, more imposing mansions and states. The poorest areas of the city, however, are full of houses made of stone and wood, with low finishing and no type of adornment. Usually narrow, and with a maximum of two floors, these buildings house numerous individuals, and are yet another example of the great economic and social disparity of this domain. Marriages in Dimoli are regarded by the aristocracy as a matter of political expediency, and suitors are carefully chosen by the family to obtain the best possible political and social advantage. As a result of this lack of feeling between couples, almost all nobles maintain secret extramarital relationships and hide their secret lovers from their rivals, to avoid scandal. Among the poorest population, marriage choices are left to the young, and made exclusively for romance reasons. A pretender with artistic talents emerges as a good catch for the chance of social ascension. The people of Dimoli have an enlightened view of magic. Divine magic is seen as valuable for its healing capabilities, and basic teaching about the nature of arcane magic is part of the education taught at boarding schools. The University of Dimoli has a specific course for arcane studies, being one of the main centers for teachings of these arts. While many places have cautious or prejudiced views of magic, the population of Dimoli stand out for having a careless and even disrespectful view of magic. Magic for many is seen as a form of entertainment, and many are the magicians who use tricks added to arcane effects to entertain in street shows and theaters. The Dimoliers are not very religious people. Although the fate of Ezra is dominant among the population, and Paul Alucin is home to one of the four sects of Ezra's church, most of the population is not very pious, and only remembers their religious devotion in times of need. The ruined chapel, Saint Mare de Labs, or the Holy Mother of Tears, is the seat of Ezra's sect but this sect stands out for esoteric and philosophical studies of the mysteries of faith, and is not dedicated to the conversion of new believers. The Church of Hala has little room in the Demolieurs' belief, but maintains some asylums and hospices in the domain, where they provide their charitable services. The government of Demolieu appears to be stable and efficient, 
especially considering that the current Lord Governor has been in power for over 30 years. However, those who look closely at the domain's social framework realize that the apparent stability hides a dangerous game of intrigue and betrayal between the aristocracy and a society on the brink of a new violent rebellion. The government is an aristocratic republic. The position of Lord Governor is a lifetime post, which is elected by the aristocracy from among its members. The current Lord Governor is Marcel Guinault, a 74-year-old gentleman, already severely weakened physically and mentally. He does not rule alone, however, for it is up to the Lord Governor to choose from among the nobles the Conseil Eclat, or the Council of Brilliance. Each of these councillors assume a portfolio of attributions and responsibilities, which include the Consulio of Arts, the Consulio of Commerce and Industry, Consulio of Defense and Order, Consulio of Social Welfare, and the Chief Consulio. Although these consulars exist to assist the Lord Governor and fulfill his will, the truth is that they accumulate a great deal of power and autonomy in the exercise of their office. The performance of these consulars is part of a complex network of interests and agendas of the aristocracy, and the result of their decisions and actions are usually the result of intrigue, manipulation, blackmail, and threats. The council meets at least once a month in the Palais de Rigente for deliberations on laws and judgments, and to discuss matters relevant to each councillor. On this occasion, they receive a limited number of supplicants, who can present their demands for consideration by the council. Once every three months, the Lord Governor traditionally holds a feast, usually after some major artistic event. These events count with the presence of the members of the Council of Brilliance, and their invitations to participate in the event are highly disputed, representing a sign of prestige for the nobility, as well as a chance to participate in the games of intrigue of the government agenda. The forces of law are called gendarmerie, and they are under the control of the Conciliar of Defense and Order. Trained in the use of musket and the rapier, these armed forces are barely sufficient to guarantee internal order and would hardly be able to withstand a Falkovnian military invasion. Most nobles do not entrust their protection and interests to the gendarmerie and also hire private guards and soldiers. These men were temporarily conscripts during the last Falkovnian invasion to defend the Mondeu. Laws are discussed and drafted by the Council of Brilliance, and then enforced by the promontors in each locality. These prosecutors are appointed by the Chief Consular Dominique Donaire, and have the autonomy and flexibility to apply punishments. Laws are vague and flexible in terms of punishment, and the outcome of a trial by the promoters is often the subject of political disputes and influential nobles can usually get away with committing most crimes. The clubs rarely find an equal judgment with the nobility, and are often the target of stricter and more rigorous punishment, the greatest penalty being a public execution by the guillotine, an ingenious beheading machine. Only the most serious crimes of great importance are taken to the Cour de Justice, or Court of Justice presided over by the chief consular and judged by all members of the Council of Brilliance. Dimolieu's economy is strong and its main asset is its cultural influence. Port Alucine is a destination for many of those seeking the sophistication and luxury of the Dimolieu's lifestyle, and the city's economy benefits from the money of those seeking its cuisine, art, fashion and education. The luxury market for its refined products won over the aristocracy of neighboring regions, adding much value to Demolieu's exportation. Its geographical position and excellent seaports 
also made Demolu an important port on the trade route between modern Tlamordia and Darkon. Demolu is also going through a process of industrialization, and the notability is investing in workshops for the production of manufactured goods. Far from the quality of Richemulot's craftwork, Demolu invests in quantity to obtain products at competitive prices, and it's not uncommon for workers in these workshops to work up to 14 hours a day. Investments in the arts and education have also paid off, and recent inventions such as printing presses, more powerful firearms, and portable watchers have generated a huge boost in the economy. Despite the thriving economy, Dimolu has a weakness when it comes to food, as its grain production is insufficient to feed its population, and the kingdom depends on trade with Falkovnia, a belligerent and enemy nation to feed them. In addition to its cultural influence, Dimolu has an important diplomatic role in the Land of the Mists, and it was under the leadership of Josephine Chantreau, Consular of Defense and Order, that the Treaty of the Four Towers, a pact of mutual defense against the Falkovnia Kingdom, was conceived. After concluding our journey to Dimolu, we finally arrive at the imposing capital Port Alucine. Wandering around and looking for directions, we arrive at the Quartier Savant, where Alaric Ray's home and office is located. We are not greeted by the elf detective, however, but by a human who introduces himself as Dr. Arthur Sedgwick. Despite the initial distrust, we present our recommendation made by the Redemay family, and the doctor then treats us as allies. He informs us that his friend and ally Alanik Ray is missing after becoming involved in an investigation into possible nefarious influences that are controlling the minds of the population of Port Alucine. Arthur is worried about his whereabouts, fearing that something has happened to him, and asks for our help in finding the detective. We volunteer to help Arthur and he handles Alanik's latest notes on the investigation. The detective was studying the history of Dimonlu, looking for some mysterious figure who was involved with the events that brought the domain to the mists and who might be responsible for the evil influence on the population's mind. The last he saw Alanik Ray, he had obtained an invitation to the festivities of the Grand Opera Nationale and intended to keep a close eye on some possible suspects. Join us, subscribe to this channel, and turn on notifications, and let's explore the notes of Alanik Ray's investigation, and uncover the clues and secrets hidden in the history of Dimonlu.